Hello, I'm Brendan Shaw. I'm an adjunct professor at the Pharmacy School at the University of Sydney in Australia. It's great to be here. And uh, welcome to AMEF Innovation Week. It's a fantastic week and congratulations to AMEF and the team for organising another fantastic week this year. Uh, the topic we're discussing today is uh, health with a gender approach. And I'm delighted to uh, uh, be joined by Professor Robin Norton, uh, who is a world expert in gender issues and healthcare. Robin is the uh, Chair of Global Health with the Imperial College in London. She's Professor of Public Health at the University of New South Wales in Sydney in Australia. And she is Founding Director of the George Institute for Global Health, uh, which is a, a leading global health research organisation. Robin joins me today from Australia. Hello, Robin. Good to see you. Hi, Brendan. Great to see you and great to be part of this year's Innovation Week. It's a pleasure. Well, look, let's get started. Um, Robin, uh, women and gender issues in health is becoming a really topical, a major timely topic at the moment with the UN, uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, discussing all of these issues. We've had the World Economic Forum in January discussing this with uh, McKinsey's launching a report talking about a health gap between men and women. Uh, and um, more locally in Mexico, we've got a, a presidential election this year where a couple of the major candidates are women uh, for, for becoming res Mexico's president. And the George Institute itself has been doing research work with uh, AMIF and the Institute of Public Health in Mexico about women and, and, and NCDs and, and health. So very topical issue. So thanks for your time to join us today to talk about all of this. Um, what we might start with really is if you want to start just talking about why is it important to consider gender in healthcare? Why do we need to talk about these issues? Why is it so important? Great. Thank you very much, Brendan. Um, when we're thinking about gender and healthcare, we might also we might actually think about sex, gender, and healthcare. Um, and while I'm going to mostly talk about the focus on um, ex gender and healthcare from the perspective of women's health, we need to remember that it, it's a broader issue than that, and I'll touch on that a bit later. So much of what we know about women's healthcare tends to be based on research and evidence that we have primarily from studies on white middle-aged males. And that would be fine if white middle-aged males and the diversity of women were all the same, but they're not. And so now we're learning as we start to investigate sex and gender differences in healthcare that there are clear differences in the way in which women present with disease, the types of symptoms they have, how they're treated by the healthcare system, and how they respond to healthcare. So it's a, it's a big issue, and, and certainly you mentioned the World Economic Forum and the McKinsey Health Institute report, Closing the Women's Health Gap. They highlighted as one of their key points that women may live longer than men, but on average spend 25% more of their lives in debilitating health. So if we want to close the gender gap, especially for women, then we need to do something about it. We need to understand the role that sex plays in women's health. In other words, what are the biological things that are different between men and women? We also need to understand the role that gender plays in health. So how does the system respond? How do women respond um, to their knowledge about their health care and how does that affect their health? Just one other point I would make then, as I said, going beyond um, just a focus on women, we know that starting to better understand the roles of sex and gender and health has also the potential to benefit men's health. There are certain areas, for example, in the area of osteoporosis, where we know the focus has really been on women and we know so little about men. But we also know a focus on sex and gender in health has the potential to also benefit more diverse populations, trans individuals, um, non-binary people, and people with variations of sex characteristics and intersex people. So uh, 
as a white middle-aged man myself, uh, can you tell me a bit more about what what are the barriers? What are the disparities and barriers between women and men's health? I mean, why? What are the differences? Why are we seeing this? So I perhaps use a couple of examples that may be relevant here. Perhaps that the well most well researched area is in cardiovascular disease. Um, for many years, we talked about these are the typical symptoms of a heart attack. But we now know those are the typical symptoms of a male heart attack, not a female heart attack. So what does that mean? It means that when women are having various symptoms, they don't understand that this is possibly a heart attack. They just think, oh, I'm not feeling so well. So when they go to the primary care centre, seek medical attention, often the same applies with respect to the healthcare providers. They are used to understanding the typical symptoms. So by the time that a woman is actually properly diagnosed as having had a heart attack and treated, there's a serious delay in the time from that heart attack occurring to the time of treatment. We also know that when women have, have been treated and following a heart attack, that so often afterwards that the ways in which they are, are treated while they're having a heart attack and immediately after a heart attack are often not aligned to the clinical guidelines for management to the same degree they are with men. And that woman, when women leave the hospital, um, they often are not receiving the appropriate medication that they should be for men. One example. A quite a different example is the issue of endometriosis, which of course is a woman-specific health condition. But what we have found over time is that we know across the world that time from symptom to diagnosis is about eight years. And a lot of this is emerging from an understanding that the way in which again, both women to some degree, but primarily healthcare pr pr practitioners respond to women with pain is often, this is not really anything. Um, this is, yeah, you, you, you've got some mental health issues. These are not serious issues. So now we're starting to understand more and more that pain, symptoms of pain, need to be properly investigated and managed so that at least we can start to then put a diagnosis, women understand what that diagnosis is, and we can start to treat those conditions. So why is this happening? I mean, is, is it because uh, we've got gaps in the research or in data, is it that we haven't bothered researching this stuff or the people haven't put, researchers haven't had a gender lens or view when they're looking at these things, or is it because it's all old middle-aged men who are running the health system? I mean, what's what's the reasons for all this happening? Possibly a bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> we we certainly know, um, and it is still the case that if you look at the engagement of women as participants in medical research, um, and in particularly clinical trials they are underrepresented in proportion to the prevalence of disease in the population. And for many years, we had big studies that were being undertaken globally that didn't have any women at all. That's changing. It is changing, but we're still not there yet. And we still know that in many studies, um, women are underrepresented compared to the prevalence in the population. But even if they are included, a lot of the times studies, researchers don't analyse their data, um, disaggregating their data by sex and or gender, and then they don't report that data. For example, we just undertook a, a, a review of research in Australia over um, a one-year period in the main medical journals in Australia and showed that only 29% of papers that were published in the journals, analyzed their data and reported their data by sex and gender. So we've still got a long way to go in that respect. Look, some would 
also say that's part of the problem and it's a, certainly a big problem that can be fixed. Um, but part of the problem is that we still find too often that um, women are not in senior leadership positions, whether it's editors of medical journals or whether it's in clinical health systems, they're not there. And we, we, we do see that when women are senior authors on medical research, either first authors or last authors, that the chances that data have been disaggregated by sex and gender are much greater. So, and some would go a lot further and say misanthropy is part of the problem here as well. But look, I think we need to, if we can fix those other two areas, then we could make a big difference. And, and maybe um, with more women in positions of seniority in, in the medical system, um, I believe we'll see a great change. I find it quite astounding, actually, when you step back and think about it, that we're talking about a research and research intensive, a data intensive sort of activity where 50% of the population's views aren't being adequately considered in the research. It's quite it's quite amazing. The other thing, just as an aside, I was going to ask you about was in terms of barriers and the financial barriers that may exist as well. I mean, I think the... Um, the, I was just reading the McKinsey report you mentioned before, and it was saying that if if we can get equality and health gains across the world between men and women, there's something quite apart from the social and equitable issues that's going to generate a trillion dollars a year for the global economy each year. I mean, there's quite an economic story to this as well, isn't it? Empowering women and having healthy women in society. Oh, you know, that, that report, is, I think, will be quite transformative because it shows many people for the first time that with relatively small investments, and I think they're saying for every dollar invested in women's health, it would be about $3 in economic growth. And this is massive. So it, it, and it, it's really, even in a single workplace, the report... Um, really highlights the fact that if you can change workplace practices, and I think more and more people are recognising, for women in particular, um, premenopausal symptoms, um, premenstrual syndrome, menopausal symptoms, perimenopausal symptoms, if a workplace is able to manage those systems and retain women in the workforce, then the financial gains are going to be massive. So you're absolutely right. There's issues in, in health equity here. There are issues in improving health outcomes. And frankly, there are major economic gains um, that are going to come about by, by changing the systems that we have at the moment. So we've got gaps in our research and data, gaps in our uh, understanding of the issues. And then so we're moving on to health policies. I mean, what do we do about this? So, so how do we incorporate... Uh, gender issues into health policy development and then thinking what are some good examples you're aware of where this has happened where health systems are starting to take into account these gender issues I mean what do we need to do in the health policy space so that's an area that we've we've been at the forefront of lately um, we work with colleagues internationally who uh, produced a review a few years ago two or three years ago now which was looking at what was happening happening across health and medical research health systems globally. And we know that there are fantastic examples in the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the NIH, European Commission, where they have developed policies and it require researchers and funders to ensure that women are appropriately, appropriately represented in studies and that data are, are analysed. Now, in Australia, we've been behind the we've been behind in this respect. But what we've been doing recently is taking, a, in particular, we've work, been working alongside the major research funder, the National Health and Medical Research Council, as they have now developed a statement on incorporating sex and gender into health and medical research. We've provided a lot of the evidence for that statement. And then we've been working alongside with a series of policy workshops with the 
Association of Australian Medical Research Institutes to develop policy that comes from the ground up, from researchers saying we want to do the best research possible, and that means ensuring that women are included in research and we disaggregate our data. We've also been doing working in the UK where um, our, our original work showed that of the major funders in the UK, none had policies relating to the incorporation of sex and gender. So we're, we're thrilled over the last three years, we've been working with these major funders. And just before Christmas, 29 of the largest funders in the UK put out a statement of intent that they were going to produce policies um, about the integration of sex and gender in health and medical research. So there's a momentum there at the moment. We're very keen to take the, the, the approaches we've used and work with colleagues in other countries to adapt those so we can change the landscape. Because if you change it at, at, at the level of research, you then have the potential to change it at the level of healthcare practice. And that ultimately is what we want to do. We want to ensure that guidelines, um, clinical care guidelines, take into account those sex and gender differences that are identified in research. And that as a consequence, we'll see better health outcomes for women and um, better health equity. And look, it's a great, great point you made about health services and it's sort of the, there's the research side, sort of getting all the research up and then delivering it in practice and health services. And I know the George Institute has already done some fantastic work in places like India and China, I think, as well, also looking at how women can be uh, uh, caught by the health system or at least you know addressed by the health system approach. And there's some great work you guys have done there. Um, and there's obviously the project uh, working with the guys in Mexico. Um, so what does it mean in practice in terms of delivery of health services? What are sort of the implications of that? How, how do we take this forward? There are a range of opportunities. And again, I think just referring to this World Economic Report, which I've been very mindful of, and I, I'm sure some of those who are in the audience would be mindful of, that we know that since 1980, drugs were 3.5 times more likely to be removed because of safety risks for women compared to men. And they also pointed out that 64% of medical intervention studies were found to put women at disadvantage, either due to lower effectiveness, less access, or both. Now, those are pretty compelling statements. And I, I, I think certainly at Innovation last week, we talked about the fact that the pharmaceutical industry can make a huge difference here. They can be at the forefront of ensuring trials that they undertake um, have adequate numbers of women, data are disaggregated, and we present and show those differences. And what does it mean? What does it mean for particular drugs or particular dosages? So I think clearly there's still a lot within the healthcare system in terms of women's access. And I think that comes down to issues to some degree about health literacy. As I mentioned before, those examples in the cardiovascular disease area, literacy for women, for patients themselves, but importantly, and one of the thing, importantly, is health literacy for clinicians. Um, one of the roles that I've taken on recently is as a member of the Australian National Women's Health Advisory Council. And I have to say one of the key issues on our agenda as we're discussing these issues of integration of sex and gender into health and medical research policy and practice is the importance of health literacy for healthcare pr practitioners. So I think that that is fundamental and that will improve access and it will improve treatment, I have no doubt. And so you mentioned the pharmaceutical industry and obviously you know, for the audience of this talk as well, one of the one of the other uh, questions is, you know, what does this mean for the business sector? How, how, do, how, do, how do companies, how, do, how does industry, how does industry engage in this? Uh, and how do they take the lead perhaps on some of these issues going forward? So I've mentioned the, the opportunities with respect to clinical trials. 
I think there's also, as indicated in this World Economic Report, a, a financial opportunity. It's a real opportunity to realise that developing products that take a gender responsive lend could be has the potential to be a real business winner. So that's something, looking at innovation that is about catering for the woman's specific health market is, is going to be really important. Now, Femtech has jumped onto this as well, but it's not just about um, women's specific health conditions. As we talked about, it's, it's looking at those sex and gender differences and how do you develop products that are gender responsive. But frankly, the business sector also can play a role in terms of women in leadership. They need to be at the forefront in terms of women on boards, women in senior management, and assisting women throughout that the whole their whole career journeys. But we also know, as I mentioned before, why can't the business world and the pharmaceutical community in particular be at the forefront too of designing workforces that recognize the needs of the healthcare needs of women, and again, refer to that um, World Economic Report because it is so, um, World Economic Forum Report, because it is so relevant. How do you design when you've got the majority of women who uh, um, uh, have menstrual problems or starting to think about um, menopause? How can you design a better way workplace that retains those women in the workforce? because that's an economic winner as well. So a range of opportunities there. Look, uh, uh, it's it's a great example of a broader issue, I think, which is that as well as being socially positive and inclusive, an inclusive agenda as well, um, it's again another example where improving health has enormous social and economic benefits for society. So it's a good thing to do from an equity perspective, but also it's actually a massive economic benefit if we get this right. If we get health care for women right, then there's an enormous economic payoff down the track. Totally, and I think it's probably the latter that's going to win the hearts and minds rather than the other. Um, so uh, that's why I think I was mentioning um, this report is, is really going to highlight some of these issues. Certainly towards the end of last year, we know the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the National Institutes of Health in the US put out major reports as well, called for funding to address many of these issues. But frankly, this report from the Forum and the McKinsey Health Institute, I think is going to really play to those working in the business sector who realise, as you said before, you know, it could boost the global economy by $1 trillion from earlier deaths and um, fewer earlier deaths and health conditions and the greater capacity for women to contribute to the economy and to society. And just to put that into context, uh, $1 trillion a year is equivalent to adding the economy of the Netherlands or Turkey into the global economy every year. It's, that's the size of the economic benefit you're talking about. So it's really quite amazing. Robin, we're almost out of time. And I'm just thinking about um, how we go forward with all this. You know, we've got a uh, we've got a great discussion happening at Innovation Week this week. We've obviously got, you know, obviously uh, gender issues are quite important in Mexico at the moment with the presidential election going on. And internationally, there's lots of debate about this. And we've already talked about a number of quite a different sort of research strategies and business strategy. I mean, if we think of a plan of action to go forward, uh, what are sort of the couple of things, two or three things you think that people in the audience, if they're thinking about what, what do we need to do to take this forward, what are sort of a couple of key things you'd suggest to recommend uh, as a final sort of question to think about, okay, how do we take this forward? What do we need to do? Being the scientist, I'm going to say data, data and data. You know, it's it's all very well to, to talk to talk, to talk. But once you have the data, then you can measure what is happening or what is not happening and then put in strategies and monitor those strategies over time. 
So I think really starting to say what, where are, what, what's happening at the moment? What's happening in terms of women in senior positions? What's happening at the moment in terms of what is what is our workplace environment like for women and health conditions? And what are we doing in terms of um, are we appropriately including sufficient women in trials? Are we disaggregating data? So I think having data, measuring, and then monitoring is key to making a difference. I'm absolutely convinced of that. It just reminds me, uh, former Director General of the World Health Organization, Margaret Chan, had a, had a great quote. She said, what gets measured gets done. And that was her oh, argument about having, having data. Totally. The first step is having the information, the data to go forward. Totally, yeah. Great, Robin. Look, thank you very much for your time. That's been an excellent discussion. And um, uh, thank you for your time and look forward to uh, hearing more about this as we go forward. Robin, thank you for your time. A pleasure. And um, I hope the rest of Innovation 2024 goes well for the team. Indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you.